Did you know that your help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth? That's what Psalm 121 verse two says. Our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You got some pretty big help. So I don't know what kind of week you have, but in the name of Jesus, I just believe that this is gonna be a blessing to you and that God's word is gonna encourage you to set your focus again, set your gaze back on his word, on his truth, on his life for you so that you can be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, let's just ask the Lord for help right now. Father, we need your help. We need all the help that you provide for us, and we get it through Jesus. And Jesus said that we have a helper living right here with us. It's the precious Holy Spirit who Jesus has on assignment to unfold, unveil the word of truth, not just to have the word with us, but to have it moving and breathing in our life. And we receive all of that help right now in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. At the cross. At the cross, part two. A little quick review here. Part one, we talked about turning the curse into a blessing. And yes, the curse is real. No, death, destruction, decay are not acts of God. They're part of the curse. But the blessing of God, the blessing of the Lord is real. And that's why God sent his beloved son, Jesus, his only begotten son, Jesus, because God loves you and he wants you to be blessed. Jesus turned the curse into a blessing for us. And that's what we learned in part one. You got to review it again. You got to listen to it again. You got to meditate on it. Get the song and meditate on it. You know, a teacher in children's ministry was quizzing her six-year-olds. She goes, what comes after Good Friday? They were in the Easter holidays. And so, you know, she wanted to kind of quiz the kids and get them all um, aware of what's on the calendar. What comes after Good Friday? She said, a little girl answered, Easter Sunday. And then that teacher said, what is that about? She said, well, Jesus rose up from the grave. The teacher was about to compliment the little girl when she continued. The little girl is... Continued, and she said, and if Jesus sees his shadow, we won't have spring for another seven weeks or more. <laughs> if only, if you only have part of the good news, you have something akin to groundhog theology, right? Part of the truth is not the truth at all. That's like being a quarter percent pregnant. It's all or nothing. For the next few minutes, I'm going to help focus our attention on nothing but the blood of Jesus. Because you see, at the cross, that's what happened. Jesus shed his blood. And we need to focus on nothing but the blood of Jesus right now. Something mysterious happened at the cross. Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 22 that the communion cup represented his shed blood. That means poured out. But where his blood was poured out is key. Jesus didn't shed his blood out back of Jerusalem from a knife wound or quietly bleed out in Nazareth somewhere. He poured out his blood at the cross, the place of the skull or the ultimate place of the curse. To understand the importance of Jesus shedding his blood at the cross, let's get just a little bit medical. Come with me, just a little bit medical talk here. The most intimate interaction between your blood and the outside world is your breath. Blood gets oxygen when your lungs perform a gas exchange with your blood. Blood is a living tissue that is a matrix made up of liquids and solids. You cannot live without blood. The health of your physical being and your immune system is in great part measured by, you guessed it, the health of your blood, your red and white blood cells, and all the other important nutrient levels. The Bible says in Leviticus 17, 11, the life is in the blood. And guess what? Blood speaks. It speaks of our health, our genetics, our history, and more, our spiritual condition. Adam at his beginning, had no life in his blood. His blood was there, but it was dormant and inactive. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Can you just imagine that? God doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth or CPR way back in Genesis, and we thought it all started in the 1700s. <laughs> yeah, God has the patent on that too. You and I ultimately source our blood origin from our great-great-great-granddaddy, Adam. 
Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Look at this. And he made from one man common origin, one source, one blood, every nation of mankind. Think of it. There are many, many different nationalities, but there is one common human species to trace back to. There's just one big problem with our blood. We were born with a spiritual disease called sin. It's not your fault. It started back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve when they committed treason against God the Father, the Father of all intelligent design. And you know how they did it? By obeying the Father of all lies, Satan the deceiver. Adam lost the life in his blood. He lost the illuminating factor in his DNA. Adam in the Hebrew language means first blood, first of mankind, first human being. You and I may look different, but our blood can be traced back to Adam. And therefore, tangled up in our DNA is the curse. When Adam sinned, he did not fall from heaven. Let me say that again. When Adam sinned, he didn't fall from heaven. He fell from dominion and power. He lost his identity as a child of God. He lost his child of God status. Therefore, he lost his purpose. He lost his calling, all of his authority and dominion over the stuff, and life got hard. Who of us has not had stuff tell us what to do, right? Have you ever had your bills tell you what to do? Your money tell you what to do? Have you ever had the weather tell you what to do? Or maybe even a virus tell you what to do? Stuff. Have you ever wondered why life can be hard? Even your evil desires bossing you around? Adam did the opposite of being born again. His treason against God invited Satan to curse him, to master him, to control him, and us. Look at Cain and Abel, the first children of Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel. Cain murdered his brother, and you can't blame the culture. I mean, the culture was just getting going. You can't blame violent video games or movies. Cain got his dad's blood. It's a genetic disorder that's got murder in it right from the beginning. Humanity's blood carries spiritual death. Physical death is a byproduct of our sin disorder. Romans 3, verse 23, For all have sinned, all have sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. Have you ever noticed that children don't need to be taught how to disobey? how to sin. I, I had a great mom and I didn't need anybody teaching me how to disobey or how to lie or how to be rebellious. It just came natural. There was a four-year-old boy who got in trouble with his mom. Don't you dare set one foot outside this house. She came back to the family room a little while later only to find the little boy laying outside on the deck with the patio door wide open and both of his little feet still inside the house. Creative disobedience. We like to see how close we can come to crossing the line without legally disobeying, right? The intent of our heart. Disobedience is a symptom and an outcome. Yes, sin is a problem, but it's a symptom and evidence of being lost, unholy, broken, and in need of a Savior. We have a problem with our blood, folks. It carries a genetic code for brokenness, unholiness, disorder, a spiritual mutation that keeps us separated from God, independently lost. We sin because we're without God. We're in darkness. We're morally broken and corrupt. You were meant to be in a loving relationship with God the Father, the source of all life, but God is holy and he cannot be connected with anything of sin anything of disloyalty, anything of the enemy, the devil. Remember, Adam in Hebrew means first blood, first of mankind. Jesus, coincidentally, is called the last Adam. If you're reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, it calls Jesus the last Adam, the last. So if you think about him being the last Adam, he is therefore the last first blood. God, so in love with you, determined to pay all of your debts and to redeem each one of us. Praise God. How? With the last Adam. The price must always be paid. You see, that's the principle of forgiveness. The price has to still be paid. 
The wages of sin is death, Romans 6 verse 23 says. So how can humanity get full, complete forgiveness if the debt isn't paid? I mean, the kind of forgiveness that stops the curse. You see, you somebody can say, I forgive you, but if the curse doesn't stop, it's not actually a court-ordered judicial decree and then activating the blessing. How do we do that? Well, look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, and this is going to encourage you. In fact, under the law, almost everything is cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, neither release from sin and its guilt, nor cancellation of the merited punishment. So how does this encourage you? Okay, let's be honest here. It has to be blood that is pure, without sin, without corruption. Ah, uh, you can see I'm pointing at Jesus, right? We're in this mess because of tainted blood. So offering a curse for the curse won't stop the curse, right? That makes sense. Human blood is the most corrupt substance on earth. It begins to rot. Did you know this? It begins to rot as soon as it means open air. The blood of God, though, is a spiritual vaccine and an inoculation against the curse. Yes. So how, how in all eternity can God get his perfect, um, perfect blood from heaven to earth to vaccinate humanity? How can he do it? Oh, glad you asked. The virgin birth. A little biology lesson for you here now. The seed of the father carries the blood to the child. The egg or body is supplied by the mother. The blood of the mother never mixes with the blood of the unborn baby. The baby gets its oxygen and nutrition through the placenta. In God's genius plan to save us, he has sent a perfect savior born of a virgin. God's seed would be the word carrying God's blood, his pure blood, but never mixing with the woman's blood who was of the original seed of Adam. The first blood, the contaminated blood. John 1 verse 14, and the word Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you see the genius in that? Jesus is the last Adam, born with pure blood. The Holy Spirit supplied the word, which is Father God's seed. The Virgin Mary supplied the egg, which carried all the chromosomes for hands, feet, eyes, his back, his body. But Mary did not contribute to the Lord's blood. No, 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 no. Just a little bit more biology on the matter. As the baby develops in the womb, it's separated from the mother by the placenta. That, that's as far as the mother's blood goes to the placenta. Through the process of diffusion and osmosis, nutrients and oxygen transfer through the membrane to the child by way of the umbilical cord. Mom's blood circulates on one side of the placenta and the baby's blood circulates on the other. Now, this is so important because never do the two bloods mingle. They're separate. This is why it's not uncommon for the baby's blood type to be different than mom's blood. Jesus being born of the Blessed Virgin Mary means his blood came from only one source. Jesus' blood type was pure holiness, perfect, flawless. Not Adam's blood, but God's blood. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 47. The first man, Adam, is from the earth, earthly, made of dust. The second man, Christ, the Lord, is from heaven. And yes, born of the blessed Virgin Mary. Does God's use of biology engineering rattle you a little bit? Remember, he invented biology. The intelligent designer is the originator of all science, of all matter, of all energy. You may know the science of computers, but that doesn't mean you know Bill Gates. Science is discovering the how, but God is the who of original engineering and design. Christianity is not independent of science. Many cosmologists believe in Christ because the stars speak of God's glory. They get converted just looking at God's creation. Biology, even your own laminin, speak of the intelligent designer. You know, it was years ago, but Pam and I got to do this TV show and interview Dr. Hugh Ross, who is an astrophysicist, an expert on the integration of God's truth and science. He is such a genius and yet so humble. In his testimony of coming to Christ, he spoke of the mathematical perfection of even just Genesis 1, the very first chapter, and how it so persuaded him as an atheist to believe in God, the intelligent designer. 
See for yourself. I want you to see for yourself and recognize the blessedness of the intended outcome of God sending a last Adam, Jesus. God put the first Adam in the Garden of Eden. We know that well. But he would not have had to send a second Adam, Jesus, except that God so desired to redeem you, to redeem me, to buy us back from the curse and bring us back into his original design and plan of blessing. Let's read Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14 again. Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the curse of the law and its condemnation by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs crucified on a cross. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might also come to the Gentiles, that's you and me, so that we would all receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. Oh, my dear friend, Jesus' blood is not just our hope over death. It's not just our hope over the fragility of mortality, but it's our hope to be redeemed eternally. The deep end of the pool is a frightening place for those who don't know how to swim. That makes sense. It's not that they can't swim. It's just that they don't know how to swim. Deep waters terrify people with an ignorance of the how. How does it work? Death is a terror to those who don't know the how of eternal life in Christ Jesus' blood. It's not that they can't know it. It's that they don't know it. Ignorance and refusal of the truth is humanity's great death trap. The enemy relies on you being ignorant of the truth. Many people today are angry at religion. They're angry at the church. Why? Because people want real answers. And they, they want real answers. And religion or church is not the cure. Jesus is. Jesus is the cure. Jesus, perfect, pure blood is the only panacea for this sin disease world. God's DNA is the only inoculation to this deadly sin disease. Again, it's not a morality issue. It's the curse. I told you in part one that this message, this, this truth of at the cross is powerfully real to me, especially after my mom's passing just a few weeks ago and the crushing trials and experiences that I've known and that my wife and I have known, me and my family, and you can probably identify with that. Maybe someone you love has died suddenly or even worse, very, very slowly, leaving you feeling helpless, crushed, you can appropriate every benefit of Jesus' victory at the cross. His perfect shed blood for you and for me. It's a faith thing, but it's also a focus thing. What you focus on is what becomes your reality. It becomes your perception and your perception becomes your reality. Did you know that what you focus on gets magnified in your life? We've all experienced focusing on bad news, haven't we? It only gets worse. And it seems overwhelming. It takes our life. It hijacks our life. But if you focus on Jesus' victory at the cross, I'm telling you this from my own experience going through such great pain and difficulty, the benefits of Jesus' shed blood and victory at the cross will overtake your life. I'm so excited about this for you. This is a turning point in your life. If you just take it, I want you to have it. Jesus, pure blood has no corruption, no death, no decay, and zero condemnation. We get a spiritual blood transfer from Jesus, the Son of God, who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Yes, He is also the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, so there is a supernatural cleansing, but there is also a life-giving, bold power, the power in the blood of Jesus. Ever since Calvary, where Jesus' blood was released into the world, Eternal life has been within the reach of every person on planet Earth. God's love is within everyone's reach by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? No, oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. Praise God. God is very justice-minded, 
So let me escort you into the spiritual courtroom of eternity. On this side is the prosecution, the accuser. On the other side, Jesus, our counselor. Father God is the judge and the Holy Spirit is running the whole proceedings. Note, Jesus is courtroom conscious. Remember, he didn't give any answer to the Pharisees, did he? Nothing to the religious leaders. When they brought him before the high priest court, why? Because he's the king, the king dying as the king of a kingdom, not as a religious figure. They had him in the wrong court, my friend. They had him in a religious court. That's why he didn't give an answer. He didn't answer until they brought him before a political leader, Pontius Pilate, a ruler, a king. They wrote over his cross, king of the Jews, not priest of the Jews, king of the Jews. Jesus is very justice-minded. Only a king can appoint. Did you know that? And Jesus appoints you to life and a blessing. Jesus chased after death on our behalf. He didn't avoid it. He walked right into it. We were appointed to death and Jesus, our Savior, went intentionally after death so that he could appoint us to life as our king. Oh, my friend, I hope you're enjoying this. So in the courtroom of eternity, which side are you on? The religious leaders of Jesus' day, they sided with the accuser. They rejected life. They rejected King Jesus. For 30 pieces of silver, Judas went to the wrong side of the courtroom, my friend. I was appointed to death for my sin. So Jesus went to war with death for me, for you. They didn't force him on the cross. Did you know that? He willingly laid down his life. 12 legions of angels at his disposal. Jesus conquered the reign of death by dying and taking back his own life. Look at John 10, verse 18. No one takes away from me my life, but I lay it down and have power to take it again. Oh, my friend, Jesus was never out of control. Do you feel like the trials and tribulations have cornered you so that you're out of control? You need to be at the cross, at his place of victory. Nobody goes to hell because of their sin. People go to hell for rejecting Jesus' blood as a ransom for their sin. Jesus has conquered sin, death, and hell, but you've got to receive the price he paid. It's the how. If you reject Jesus, there is no other name, no other identity, no other blood for you by which you can be saved. John 1 verse 12. Oh, I love this verse. But to as many as did receive Jesus, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is to those who believe in his name. You get the right to be blessed. When you receive Jesus, you receive his finished work at the cross. You get his shed blood, perfect in every way, crying out mercy and forgiveness for you. Yes, when you're a child of God, the courtroom of justice works for you. Judgment works for you in your favor. Did you know that? When God hears mercy from his son's blood, the gavel comes down in your favor. Judgment is for you, not against you. Love is for you on your side. Jesus is on your side. Pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, here I am at the cross. I surrender my life to you. You died in my place. You rose up from the grave. I repent of my sin. Forgive me. You conquered death. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Now help me to live for you. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>